Lars and Isabel met in Rome, Italy in 1896. Isabel was on her finishing tour of Europe and the Middle East. Lars was an American diplomat. He was the first secretary at the American Embassy in Rome. After their marriage in June of 1897, Lars and Isabel took the first of two wedding trips. And their first wedding trip was to Japan uh, and China. On their return from their second honeymoon, Lars served briefly in the American Army. And they decided then that they needed another wedding trip because they were undecided about where they wanted to live. So they went on a second trip, this time to India, and during that trip is when they decided that they would buy the old Weld Estate in Brookline, that's now Lars Anderson Park. In 1901, Isabel came into her full inheritance, and that was when they started the major project, the Italian Garden, that became the first way that they shaped the Brookline property to their own tastes. The Bowling Green and the wooded area beyond it and the Italian garden beyond that were designed together by Charles A. Platt to work as a garden system that would gradually bring a visitor into the Italian garden and create a very theatrical moment of surprise. You see around the perimeter of the Bowling Green a very nice balustraded wall with bench seating. This is in the Beaux-Arts style of architecture, which was in fashion during the years that Lars and Isabel were married. If you look to this wall, this is in the Romanesque style. Henry Hobson Richardson, who lived here in Brookline, was a practitioner, and in fact some say he adapted this to the American environment. So you see the juxtaposition of old and new, and one of the things that, that is remarkable about the Lars Anderson Park is the extent to which there are actually architectural remnants that help us see what their tastes were and what their aesthetics were. In the Andersons' time, uh, the garden that you would have seen from this perspective would have been a profusion of color. Unlike most Italian gardens, the plantings would have been dark green. Mrs. Anderson wanted a continual profusion of color in all planting seasons. And so they planted and replanted and dug up flowers. Nothing would be dormant. Everything would be at its peak. When you look at what the, the Italian garden meant to them, this was really the epicenter of their love for each other. One of the things that is really new information, a new insight, is how extensive the agricultural and horticultural operations were on the estate during the years that the Andersons were there. Where these um, spruce trees are, this was a much more gently sloping hill than it is now. This grade has been added to create access to the um, ice rink. But this is where Mrs. Anderson's rose garden was and there was a pathway that led from the back of the Italian garden. And then up on the hill, there was more of a wooded area than you see now. Uh, and Lars Anderson had what he called his gnome woods. We're looking now at the uh, Lars Anderson Auto Museum. Um, it was known as the Carriage House in the Anderson's day. It was built by Billy Weld, Isabel's first cousin. Uh, in 1888. It was also designed by Edmund Wheelwright and it is uh, modeled after the Chateau de Chaumont in the Loire Valley in France. Lars Anderson was someone who loved technology. He bought about one automobile a year. The Car Museum now has about 15 of his most distinctive um, automobiles and if you've never been in to see it you really should go in. Also to see the beautiful interior that Billy Weld had designed. This is the area of the estate um, from the Tempietto up to where those walks all come together that Mrs. Anderson used for her great public spectacles, plays, dances, musical performances, poetry readings. At that end of this, um, of this lawn was a circle called the Rondpoint, or as they called it sometimes, the Court of the Four Seasons. It was a circle that was outlined by four low walls, so there were four entrances. 
from that rond-point leading straight down and up into that thicket was an alley of trees. So two straight rows of trees that created an avenue. It, Lars and Isabel lived through World War I together and Mrs. Anderson lived wo through World War II after Mr. Anderson's death. And they were both very patriotic Americans and they, they found ways to get involved in the war effort. Uh, part of the home front movement response to the war was the creation of Victory Gardens. And during World War I, they turned the polo field into a potato field. Up above us, um, on the hill, are the Brookline Community Gardens. And the presence of the gardens here is very consistent with a couple of the things I've already mentioned. First of all, the fact that the estate was open to the public and that a lot of people were fed from the Andersons' gardens, and the same thing holds true with the community gardens. This is called the English Garden. The entire scene that you see here was designed by the firm of Little and Brown between 1910 and 1916 to reflect what we might think of as an English countryside, that it sort of, it looks sort of naturalistic and picturesque, and yet the placement of every tree and every rock and every boulder has been carefully thought out. The Tempietto at the far end, it creates a focal point within the English garden, and it is an exact replica of the Tempietto di Diana, the Temple of Diana, in the Borghese Gardens in Rome. This causeway was one edge of a large square of interconnected walkways that surrounded the, um, the lagoon. A causeway, a trellis, an alley, and a path through the woods. Four different kinds of walkways integrated. And when you look at them on the map, it's almost a perfect rectangle. This is a modern living, breathing park that people come to and enjoy. And just as in the Andersons' time, the estate was used for entertainment and recreation, so too is it being used in those ways today. Billy Weld um, had this polo field created. If you look across the field, you'll see a large stone retaining wall. This was built as a spectator area. Even though the garden and the house are no longer standing, the vestiges of what they created, what they left behind, is still there and available for anyone to see. I think the Andersons would be very, very pleased and proud to know that the land that was so dear to them, that they had shaped over many, many years and at very great cost into their perfect uh, living environment, that the people of Brookline were now using this same land in ways consistent with how they wanted to use during their lifetime, I, I think that they would be very pleased.